you have for us, that we would understand what you are saying to us, that we would be strengthened, encouraged, edified, that we would walk away today not simply knowing more about you, but being closer to you than we were when we came. Father, we open your word today in expectation, believing that you will speak to us through your word. I pray that you would help us to listen and to obey. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Open your Bibles this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Our passage today will take us from verses 35 through the end of the chapter, verse 58, as Paul concludes this teaching on the resurrection, not just the resurrection of Jesus, but also the resurrection of the believer. You see, Paul would write that we, as believers in Jesus Christ, are not to mourn as those who have no hope. That's not to say that we don't mourn. We do mourn when we experience loss, when we experience suffering, when we lose someone who is dear to us. There is a period of mourning, and that is appropriate. Even Jesus at the tomb of Lazarus wept, amen? knowing full well that he was going to bring Lazarus back to life, knowing full well that in the end we would be raised and with him for all eternity, even knowing all that, not simply as something he believed, but as something that he knew, even then Jesus wept. And we do weep, we do mourn. In fact, the Bible tells us that we are to weep with those who weep and to mourn with those who mourn. So there is an appropriate mourning. But what we need to remember in our mourning is that it is not a hopeless mourning. We do not mourn in the same manner as those who have no hope because they are devastated. Because for them, there is no promise of a reunion. But for us, in Christ, we have that promise of eternal life. Amen? Amen. So we do not mourn as those who have no hope. And yet, in Corinth... There were some who did not believe in the bodily resurrection of the believer. They had called it into question. They, they doubted it for a variety of reasons. And Paul has spent uh, the, the first 34 verses of this chapter addressing those concerns. And he began with the presentation of the gospel itself, which I'd like to read again, starting in 15, chapter 15, verse 1. Paul writes, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. I wanted to read this again in part because of that phrase, unless you believed in vain, because as he ends this chapter, he's going to revisit that thought, and it's important for us to have it in mind as we round out the rest of this chapter. You see, if there was no resurrection of the believer, as some of them were beginning to think, then their faith was indeed in vain. Because if there is no resurrection, then Christ was not raised. And if Christ was not raised, then in fact, we are still lost in our sins. And this is the case that Paul would go on to make in the next few verses. Let's just read them quickly. For I declare to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James and then by all of the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach and so you believe. And so Paul has reiterated this gospel to them, this good news to them that Christ has indeed risen from the grave. And he is listing for them 
numerous instances of evidence that support the assertion that Christ is risen. risen. He points to the scriptures. He says the scriptures foretold that he would die, that he would be crucified, that he would be buried, and that on the third day he would rise from the grave. He said he pointed then to the evidence of the other apostles. They did not believe at first when the women came from the tomb and said that Jesus had risen. They didn't believe, and yet now they are advocates for the resurrection. What changed? What was different? The difference was they had seen the risen Christ. He points to over 500 witnesses who had seen Jesus at one time, many of whom were still alive to that day that that could be asked about that situation. They could be interrogated about it. There were eyewitness accounts of the risen Savior. And then Paul points last of all to his own life as evidence, which is one of the greatest pieces of evidence for the reality of the resurrection in all of history. The reality is here was a man, Paul, the apostle, who had been previously Saul of Tarsus, a Pharisee who hated the church, who hated Christ, who made it his personal goal in life to stomp out this new sect called Christians, to wipe them out. Though they were not called Christians at the time, they were followers of the way, if you will. But Paul's intent and purpose was to completely obliterate them to persecute them out of existence. He was even standing by approving of the stoning of Stephen, one of the first martyrs of the church. And yet here we have Paul, one of the greatest opponents of Christianity, who has now become the greatest proponent of Christianity in his generation, having written the majority of the epistles in the New Testament, having preached the gospel more broadly and more profitably than any of the other apostles by his own account. Why? What changed his mind? There's only one thing that could have. There's only one thing that could have changed his mind so completely that he was willing to be beheaded over his testimony. And that was that he had seen the risen Christ. This is what he had preached. This is what the other apostles had preached. And this is what the Corinthian church had believed. They had professed faith in the fact that Jesus had indeed risen from the grave. It was a settled fact for Paul and for them. But he goes on in verse 12 to say, now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, And we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified that he has raised Christ up whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. Amen? We are of all men the most pitiable. In other words, if this life is all there is, then we had better make the best use of this life and quit wasting our time looking for a life that is to be if in fact there is no resurrection And if, in fact, Christ has not risen. But he goes on in verse 20 to say, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Now, of course, we know that the first fruits were that first part of the harvest that were brought and offered at the temple to the Lord. And by offering the first fruits, we were indicating that we had faith that the latter harvest would come in as well. We offered the first of what we had to God because we trusted him that there would be more coming after it. And Christ was indeed the first fruits from the dead. Now, we addressed this last week, but I'll address it again. You might say, well, wait a minute, Pastor Ken. Didn't Lazarus rise from the dead? Didn't Jairus' daughter rise from the dead? Didn't the son of the widow of Nain rise from the dead? Weren't there people in the Old Testament who rose from the dead? How can we say Christ is the first fruits from the dead if he was not the first person to ever be raised from the dead? Well, here's the key. All of the others who had been resurrected rose from the dead only to die again. But Christ was risen to immortality. That corruption put on incorruption, that mortal put on immortality. 
They rose to die again. He rose to live for all eternity. He is the first fruits from the dead. And something even more interesting, and I mentioned this last week, but just in case you weren't here, it's worth repeating. It's so interesting because the festival or the, the harvest, rather, excuse me, the festival of first fruits was held the Sunday following the Sabbath after Passover. Okay? Again, the festival of first fruits was held on the Sunday following the Sabbath after Passover. Jesus being crucified on the Passover, that next Saturday was the Sabbath. He rose on Sunday. Jesus, who is the first fruits from the dead, rose from the dead on the day of the festival of first fruits. Isn't God awesome? God's timing is perfect. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. There is some deep theology in this verse, and it explains to us the reason that Christ had to become a man in order to redeem us. He couldn't just forgive us. He couldn't sacrifice himself as God. He had to become one of us in order to die for us. Because in becoming one of us and living that sinless life as he did, he became our federal head. He became the leader of the human race, as it were. And as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. Does that mean everybody is going to be? No, it means those who are in Christ are going to be. You're born into Adam. You have to be born again into Christ. Amen? And if you are born again, then the gift of eternal life is yours through Jesus Christ. Now, as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, Afterward, those who are Christ's at his coming, and then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and authority and power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet, and the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet, but when he says all things are put under his feet, it is evident that he put all things under him, that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now, when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So we spoke about this at length last week. I'm not going to belabor the point today. If you want to know more about that section of scripture, I encourage you to go online and watch last week's message. However, I will say this. What we see here is that Christ is all in all. Amen? That he is made the ruler of all things and that God the Father has placed all things under Christ's authority. Now, obviously the exception is God himself because the one who placed all things under Christ's authority is not himself under Christ's authority. But when Christ has subdued all things and all things are under his authority and he has put an end to all rule and all reign, then he himself will place himself and all things under the authority of God the Father and all will be as it should be and as it was intended to be from the beginning. Amen? Now, we go on to a confusing verse in verse 29, which says, Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead do not rise at all? Why then are they baptized for the dead, and why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? I explained that to the best of my ability last week. I will simply say this. They were living in times of peril. They were living in times where being a Christian and taking a public stand for Christ could cost you your life. And so here they were being baptized and being martyred and others rising up to be baptized in the place of those that had been martyred. I think that is the best explanation for that passage, but I will acknowledge I could be wrong. It's a confusing passage and we don't take a single passage and build the doctrine out of it without having some greater understanding of what it is we're doing. So we'll acknowledge the tension in that verse 
do our best to explain it and understand it and recognize that within the context, Paul is making the case that if there is no resurrection from the dead, then why do we put ourselves in positions where we could so easily be killed? It makes no sense. If we know that this life is all that we have, it seems we would protect it a little bit better and not take such risks by professing doctrines and beliefs that are illegal and can get us executed by the government, right? But Paul is saying, look, we put ourselves in jeopardy all the time. Why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? I affirm by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. In other words, I'm taking my life in my own hands every day. If in the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me? If the dead do not rise, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. In other words, you're believing that there's no resurrection because you're accepting the philosophies of the world, of the Greeks, and of the Sadducees and others who are trying to tell you that there is no bodily resurrection. And by associating with these philosophies, you're beginning to absorb them yourself. Evil company corrupts good habits. And he says now, awake to righteousness and do not sin for some do not have the knowledge of God and I speak this to your shame. And that, conducts, uh, that, that concludes our review of the last couple of weeks, okay? And now we come to the section of scripture with which we have to do today. And in this next section, Paul is going to do something that, that reminds me of the fact that I'm a high school English teacher. Because what he is about to do is one of the things that I have taught my students to do when writing a persuasive essay. And it is a section of their essay that I like to refer to as the concession and refutation. How many of you are familiar with those terms, the concession and refutation? A couple of you had decent English teachers, okay? A couple of you. When you're writing an essay, you have to remember the audience to whom you are writing, right? You have to keep your audience in mind. And you want to try to anticipate objections that your audience might raise to the argument that you're presenting. And it behooves you to acknowledge their objections. To say, yeah, I know some of you are probably thinking this, or you might even argue this, but then to turn around and to refute those objections through the remainder of your essay or your speech. That's one of the basic principles of rhetoric, is knowing your audience well enough to anticipate their objections and to deal with those objections within the context of your argument. And that's exactly what Paul is doing here. Paul is saying, look, I know that a couple of you are gonna have some questions, so let me deal with those questions right now. Verse 35, but someone will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? I mean, these, these seem like reasonable questions. The reality is they're very foolish questions. How do we know they're very foolish questions? Because Paul calls them foolish questions. <laughs> Verse 36, foolish one. Or in other words, you fool. What a stupid question. Now, okay, I, wanna, I just want to acknowledge something right now. As a teacher, I have told a lie, and your teacher probably told you this lie too. There are no stupid questions. There are no dumb questions. Have, has, have you ever had a teacher tell you that? There are no dumb questions. Listen, folks, they are lying. <laughs> they're saying there are no dumb questions, and they're thinking, that was such a dumb question. What they're thinking is, is if you had been listening the first time I told you, you wouldn't need to ask that question, right? Paul is like, look, that is a foolish question, but he's going to go ahead and answer it anyway. Someone will say, how are the dead raised up and in what body or with what body rather do they come? Now, in this context, Paul spends very little time answering the first question and he spends the majority of his time answering the second one. He does address and scripture does address the first one in a number of areas. So let's look at it first. When Paul says God gives it, that is the new body, as he pleases and to each seed its own body in verse 38, he is answering that question. For the sake of context, let's read to there. But someone will say, how are the dead raised up and with what body do they come? Foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. 
And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. So he begins here a metaphor that he's going to continue throughout this passage, and that is the idea of a seed that is sown in the earth and brings forth a plant, right? If you take a grain of seed and you look at that seed, it is for all, for all purposes and appearances, it's dead, isn't it? It, it's not green, it's not growing. I could set a seed on this pulpit and come back a year later, and is that seed going to have changed? It's not. It's still going to look the same as it's always looked. But if I take that very same seed and I dig a little hole and I plant it in some dirt and I cover it with, with that dirt and put a little water on it and put it where the sun can shine on it, and I come back just a couple of weeks later, what's going to happen? It's going to have sprouted and there's going to be new life. But is that which is growing from the seed going to resemble the seed? No. It has the same nature as the seed. It's connected to the seed. The DNA inside of it is the same as the seed. But it is not itself the seed. It looks different. It has been transformed. It's something altogether new and it's beautiful to behold. And yet it was that same seed that if left right here would never grow, would never change. And so Paul is beginning this metaphor and he's saying that, look, when we die, we're like that dead seed that is planted in the ground and in God's time and according to God's purpose, we are going to sprout forth into new life. But God does it according to his will, according to his purpose and according to his plan, as he says in verse 38. But God gives it a body as he pleases to each seed its own body. So how are the dead raised? God raises them. That's it. That's really all the answer we need. If we search the scriptures, we can find a few other things to support this idea, some from Paul, some from other places. When Paul stood before King Agrippa, giving his defense, he said even more plainly, as Luke records in Acts 26, verse 8, speaking to King Agrippa, why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? Why? Why, why should that surprise you? I mean, when I tell you God raises the dead, you shouldn't be shocked by that. Here's the thing. If you can believe the first miracle of the Bible, God said, let there be light, and there was light. If you can believe that, that God created light simply by the power of his word, then what other miracle is there that the Bible could claim that God did that is difficult for you to believe? None, right? And so Paul asks the question, why, why King Agrippa, is it difficult or why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? In Genesis 18:14. The Lord said to Abram and Sarah, is anything too hard for the Lord? I mean, really, is, is there anything really that is too hard for the Lord? In Luke 1 37, with God, nothing shall be impossible. Amen. Uh, in Philippians, excuse me, let's go back. Luke again, Luke 18, 27, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Jesus was speaking of the, the salvation of the rich, right? He acknowledges, look, with men, some things are impossible, but with God, all things are possible. So we see here in these three verses that nothing is too hard for the Lord, nothing is impossible for the Lord. Even though they may be impossible for man, they are not impossible for God. Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 through 21 says, our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. So how are the dead raised? The answer is they are raised by God. And they are raised because nothing is too hard for the Lord, because with God nothing is impossible, because what is impossible with man is possible with God, and because he is able to subdue all things to himself. Amen? How are the dead raised? 
God raises them. Is there anything that's impossible for him? No, there is not. Now, the answer to the second question, with what body do they come, is one that Paul is going to spend uh, several verses answering through this extended metaphor of sowing the seed. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 36 again. Foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies, and what you sow you do not sow that excuse me and what you sow you do not sow that body that shall be but the mere grain perhaps weed or some other grain but God gives it a body as he pleases and to each seed its own body all flesh is not the same flesh but there is one kind of flesh of men and another flesh of animals and another of fish and, and another of birds. So he's saying, look, we know that there are different kinds of flesh and yet all of them are flesh. There are different kinds of bodies and yet they are still bodies. And the kind of body that is sown is not the same kind of body that will be raised up. He goes on to say there are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption and it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, and it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. Amen? So, there are differences between our body now and our body that will be. And the biggest difference, I suppose, is that this one that we have now is a terrestrial body. But the one that we will have is a celestial body. Not in the same sense that he means terrestrial and celestial in his example, but rather there is an earthly body and there is a spiritual body. Body. Now, make no mistake, that spiritual body is not just spirit. It's flesh and bone. It is an actual physical body. We know that because we see Christ's body, right, in the resurrection. He could eat. He could drink. You could touch him, but he could also pass through walls. He could appear in one place, disappear, and appear again in another. Now, the scripture tells us, and I will read this passage later, that we really don't know what we will be like, but this we do know when we see him, we will be like him. So in other words, the very kind of body that he has and the things that his body did, our bodies will do in that day when we stand before him. And look, I'm going to admit, there's a lot that we don't know about those bodies. But here is, in a nutshell, the difference. The body you have now was made for here and now. The body you have now was made for earth. The body you have now is not intended to live in spiritual realms, right? This body is not made for heaven. And the heavenly body that you will have is not really made for earth. Each has its purpose, each has its function, and each one will have specific properties that are natural to it according to God's plan and according to his design. Now, here's an interesting idea, and I want to present this to you simply as an idea. I don't know that this is the case. I'm not even trying to argue that this is the case. I'm simply asking the question, huh, what if this is the case? Is that fair? Yeah. I think that's fair. I hope it is. So in this passage, under verse 40 and on, we read, there are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. In other words, this body is good for some things and that body is good for some things and those are not the same things. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, 
and another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another star in glory. I love it when the Bible does that, when the Bible knows science that science didn't know at the time, right? That he can look at the stars and say, those are not all the same. Those are not all the same. There are differences between the stars. And there's a difference between the glory of the moon and the glory of the sun. Each one functions in a different way. Each one has a different appearance. Each one has a different purpose. I suspect that when we are raised from the dead, that our bodies are not all going to be the same. That our bodies are going to have similarities, but they're also going to have differences that are specific to the purpose and plan that God has for us in eternity. And that is exciting to me. Because if you look at the world and you look at the diversity that God has put into the world, how much greater will that diversity be when we have all eternity to explore and to experiment with what God has given us? Amen? Can I prove that? No. Would we make a doctrine out of that? Absolutely not. But when we are imagining what our new bodies are going to be like, let me tell you, whatever you can imagine, it's not cool enough. Is that fair? Literally, whatever you can imagine, whatever the reality is, is going to be way better than that. And that is very exciting. Amen? That gives us something to look forward to. Our current bodies were made for earth. Our new bodies will be made for heaven. These are terrestrial. Those will be spiritual. Those who are born of Adam right now, we're like Adam, but those who are born again will be like Jesus. Amen? How awesome is that? And I think I got my notes out of order, so I'm going to pull the right page here. Give me a second. Nope, I did not. It's good. All right, let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45. And so it is written... The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, which is Jesus, became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Amen? Now, this I say, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. Now, when we see a mystery in the scriptures, we need to think of it in the right way. I've said this recently, but I'll, it bears saying again. When we see something in the scriptures that is described as a mystery, we're not talking about Scooby-Doo, all right? We're not talking about blues clues. We're not talking about a mystery that we can figure out by searching for the clues and inferring what happened and putting it all together. No, that's not the kind of a mystery that is referred to here. In the scriptures, when we see something defined as a mystery, what we're being told is previously this fact was hidden and unknown, but now it is being revealed. Does that make sense? So he is telling us a secret that God is now revealing through the apostles. This is not something that was known previously, but now it is being made known to us. And here it is. We shall not all sleep. Listen to that. The mystery is we will not all die. We will not all die. That is an amazing statement because everyone has for all eternity past, with the exception of Enoch and Elijah, right? But Paul is telling the Corinthians, we shall not all sleep, 
but we shall all be changed. In other words, even if you don't die and end up being raised from the dead, you are still going to receive a new body. Why? Because this body was not made for heaven. And you need a new one in order to experience it in all of its fullness. And so we will not all die, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Now, I believe, and I've seen a number of commentators who I agree with who've made this statement, that when Paul says this corruption must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality, he's speaking about those who have died before Christ's coming and those who are alive at Christ's return, okay? So corruption is what happens to you when you're dead and buried. Your body corrupts, it decays, it dematerializes, and it turns into dust, right? It is corrupted. But that corruption will put on incorruption when called upon to do so by the King of kings and the Lord of lords, amen? Some people have uh, expressed hesitation over the idea of being cremated when they die. How many of y'all have talked to people and they've like, oh, I don't want, not me, man, I don't want, mm. well, some people have even said that, well, why would I want to be cremated if Christ is going to raise me from the dead? Don't I need that body? Well, what do you think has happened to the people who died 6,000 years ago? I mean, you're not going to go dig them up and find anything other than dust. Fire is just a quick way to get from solid to ash. I mean, that's, that's really all it is. It's, it's time sped up, if you will, right? So regardless of what physical state your body is in at the time of the resurrection, that corruption is going to put on incorruption. Amen? That which has been dematerialized is going to rematerialize in an entirely new form. And, and that is an amazing reality. It also is a scientific fact that matter is never destroyed. It simply changes form. So the matter that was Socrates is out there somewhere, dust floating in the wind, right? Right? But it's still the same matter. It's just changed its form. And so when Christ returns and the dead in Christ are raised first, that corruption will put on incorruption. And those of us who are alive at that time, mortal people who are prone to die, though we haven't died yet, we will put on immortality. In other words, that dying that we were doing is done, and now we're going to live for all eternity with him. Amen? That corruption will put on incorruption, and that mortal will put on immortality. Now, we will not all die, but we will all be changed. Going back to the final verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul writes in verse 58, therefore, my beloved, I love that. The therefore in this verse is because corruption will put on incorruption. The therefore in this verse is mortality will put on immortality. The therefore in this verse is that you will rise from the dead. Amen. Paul has spent the entire chapter building a case for the resurrection of the believer. And that case having been made, he now says, therefore, in other words, here's what you're supposed to do with what I just told you. Here is how the reality of what I have just taught you is to impact your life today, right? This is the application. And he brings it all down to this one verse, and I love this. Verse 58 
Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. Be steadfast. In other words, do not let anything move you. Be immovable. That is to say to be persistent, to be firmly persistent. In other words, do not stray from your faith. Do not back down from your confidence. Do not let go of the hope of the resurrection, but hold tightly to it because it is your eternity. Amen. So he says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. In other words, we should be busy about our father's business. We should be doing the work that God has given us to do, serving others, proclaiming the gospel, proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ throughout the entire world, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, worshiping God, growing together in fellowship. We should be busy doing the work that God has left us to do. Why? Because we can know that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. You remember what he said back in verse, or early in, not verse one, but verse two. He says, I'm just gonna read one and two. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, also, which also you received and in which you stand, by which you were saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. He says, not only have you not believed in vain, but your work is not in vain either. Amen. Your work is not in vain in the Lord. Now, I need to share with you a supplemental passage for our message today because this really fleshes out what that looks like, okay? What does it look like to remember that we are going to rise from the dead? What does it look like to remember that this world is not our home, that we're just passing through, that our treasures are stored up somewhere beyond the blue as the old bluegrass gospel song proclaims, right? What does it mean? What does it look like to live with the reality of the resurrection always present in our minds? It looks like first, not first, excuse me. It looks like Colossians chapter three. Colossians chapter three. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of this earth. Why? Because this earth is temporary and the things that are above are eternal. And if we truly believe that we are going to rise from the dead and live for all eternity with Jesus Christ, then we've got what, 75, 80, 100 years down here? And we have millennia out there, endless, millennia upon millennia. Which phase of your existence should preoccupy you? Which phase of your existence should you place the greatest value on? The one that lasts forever, amen? Amen. So, set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Amen? That, my friends, is the promise of the resurrection. And it is the promise to which we hold and in which we have confidence. And it is because of that that we do not mourn as those who have no hope. Because we do have hope. We have the hope of the resurrection. Amen? And it is a sure and a steadfast hope. May it move you. May it define the course of action that you undertake in this life. May you live this life always with an eye to the life that is to come. Amen? Amen. Because I gotta tell you a secret. Eternal life doesn't begin when you die and rise from the dead. Eternal life begins the moment that you believe.